When you're ready to open files in Photoshop, there's three, maybe four basic ways you can go about doing it. You can open up existing files. To do that, you can use the file menu. You can go through the bridge or the mini bridge. You can open up raw files from your digital camera inside camera raw, and then you can create new files. So we're going to go through each of these step by step so you can see how you go about doing it. So the first way would be to open up an existing file. You can do file open. And then this would bring you to a dialog box where you can browse for, select, and open the file. All you have to do is make your selection and click open. You could also browse through Adobe's Bridge. If you haven't used Bridge before, I highly recommend checking it out because it's a really great tool for managing your photographs. If you're a digital photographer, whether you're a hobbyist or a professional or amateur, this is a fantastic tool for keeping track of your files. You get a preview window. You can navigate through your computer to any directory. You can do batch renaming. You can sort and file. And it's just a fantastic tool. You can even create PDF slideshows. And when you find a file that you want, you can open it with your selected program. And I, I just opened up the context menu. Another way to access the bridge is through the mini bridge. And I had mentioned the mini bridge before. It's just a mini version of the bridge, and you can do a lot of the same things with it. You can navigate to a specific location on your computer, and when you find the file that you want to open, you just double-click to launch it in your workspace. You can minimize the bridge at any time to maximize the space that you're working with. The other way is to open up a file in Camera Raw, and when you go to open up a raw file, Photoshop will automatically detect that it is a raw file and will open up your file in Adobe Camera Raw or ACR, which sometimes people refer to it as. Now, Camera Raw is a really fantastic dialog box. Similar to working in Lightroom, you could make a lot of corrections to your images before you bring them into Photoshop. You're dealing with the raw data from your digital camera. And I'll just briefly show you a couple of things in Camera Raw, but I encourage you to spend some time really looking at all the tools and playing around with the different buttons and widgets so that you really get familiar with how powerful Camera Raw is. So here's a photograph of a flower. It doesn't seem like it's entirely in focus, so we can modify not only the sharpness, but we can adjust the exposure, the contrast, the highlights and shadows, the whites and the blacks. We can increase the clarity and the vibrance. There's so much we can do. So looking at the top here, we have basic features that would allow you control general exposure things. There is a button here called Auto, and if you click that, it would give you what it thinks it should be based on the algorithm and the contents of your photograph. Or you could start with auto and then make some minor adjustments. That's one thing I like to do. Although sometimes I like to trump the application and see if I can do better than the auto version. Then this next button is called Tone Curve, and this will allow you to adjust the tonality inside of your image. You can uh, set the black, the gray point, and the white marker, and you can adjust this line so that the tonality is improved in your image. This next one deals with the detail. So for instance, since this image does not look like it's very sharp, we can increase the amount of sharpening. And sometimes you need to also increase the radius in order to see how much is sharpening. The detail will also bump up the contrast there of the sharpening. And you don't really need to deal with masking unless you wanted to only sharpen a particular area of your image. So like I could really bump this up. And if I wanted to see the difference the way it was before, and the way it is after, I can just toggle this preview button on. So I might even want to bump it up even more, just like pull as much sharpening as I can out of this flower so it really, really pops. Let's just max it out. Why not? So that's the way it was before, a little bit fuzzy. Wow, big difference, right? So you can also, in this same panel, bump up the luminance. And the luminance has detail. You can bring it up or bring it down. You can also bump up the contrast. I personally love high contrast, high definition image. You can also tweak the color a little bit about. And uh, depending on the size of your workspace, make sure you check out the scroll bar because you don't want to miss anything that could be there. Other options dealing with HSL grayscale images. You can adjust the colors within your uh, images, hue, saturation, and luminance. You can convert any color image to a grayscale image. There's also split toning if you happen to want to split tone a black and white image. There's some lens correction. 
You can actually let Camera Raw auto detect what lens you're using and then based on any anomalies within the lens, do some corrections. So if you're working with a fisheye or a wide angle, anything that's sort of weird within that lens, this can get corrected there. There's some special effects that you can apply, such as adding grain, even doing some post-crop vignetting. So you can add or subtract vignetting, like lighten or darken around the edges. There's also dealing with the different camera profiles, calibrating your image to that. There's some presets which you could load in, and you can make snapshots as you're working so you can compare the different versions. Let's go back to that first basic panel and look at the white balance. So there's the temperature, which you could increase or decrease. This is like color correcting stuff. I almost think it was good where it was before. And then you can adjust the tint, like a little more green, a little more magenta, based on what the image looked like when you actually shot it. You can adjust the exposure to lighten it or darken it a little bit. I'm going to leave it back at zero. You can bump up the contrast here as well. Increase the highlights, so like pull some more whites out of there. You can darken down the shadows if you like. And then adjusting the white point and the black point within your image. So this is really popping now compared to the way it was before. You could also bump up the clarity. That's almost too much. I think I might want to bump the whites back down and the vibrance. So now check out the way it was before and the way it is after. It's a huge dramatic difference. Now, when you're done working with your color corrections and exposure in Camera Raw, you can do one of two things. You can say that you're done and all of these corrections will remain with the Camera Raw file. Or you can click Open Image, and it will open that image in your Photoshop workspace with all those corrections, and you can save it as a Photoshop file, or you can continue working on it and then save it later. So now we've dealt with opening up existing files, and we've talked about working in Camera Raw. Let's talk about opening up new files. You'll always go to the File New option here, and the File New dialog box opens up. There are some presets that you can choose from, from this drop-down menu. So you could choose US Paper, International Paper, or Photo, if you'll be working on a high-resolution image. You could choose Web, Mobile Devices, or Film and Video, if you're working with low resolution. And there's also a listing of the currently open files here. And then there's Custom. If you needed to create some custom settings, you can create them and save them, and then open with those settings later on. So if we were going to do something like work on a photo project, we'd select Photo. Then we can come in and choose any of these preset sizes, 2x3, 4x6, 5x7, 8x10, or portraits, landscapes, or you can override these settings. You know, if I knew I needed to do 10 by 8 or something like that, I can plug those in myself. When you're working with photographs, you always want to work high resolution. That's 300 pixels per inch. And you have options here, pixels per inch or pixels per centimeter, depending on where you are in the world. You can also toggle between different units of measure. You can work with inches, centimeters, millimeters, points, picas, or pixels if you're working on the web. And then color mode. If you're working on a print project, you want to be in CMYK color mode. And 8-bit is usually plenty. Other options include 16-bit. In this case, no 1-bit, no 32-bit. And then the background contents is either white, a specific background color that you specify, or transparent. And I typically leave it at white unless I know I need to start with a transparent background for some reason. There is an advanced setting down here, and you probably will never need to change this. But you could select different color profiles. So if you were going to work on a project that needed to be printed overseas, you might need to choose a different color profile. And you would select it from here. Always check with your printer before you print anything or need to prepare files for printing outside of your country. And then there's this pixel aspect ratio, which deals with the size of your pixels. And we'll talk more about that in another exercise when we deal with video. Now, if you're going to work for a web project, you would choose web. And then again, there's preset sizes that you can choose from. Your resolution is low resolution. 72 pixels per inch is the default and always RGB for any web or on screen or mobile devices or anything like that. So we would stick in our case if we're working with a photograph in the high resolution CMYK for print if we know that we need to print this. And uh, let's just choose We'll go back to 8 by 
10, something like this, and click OK. So now we've created a brand new document and we can do whatever we want with it. Now let's say you create a new document and then you realize, ugh, oh, I made it the wrong size. No need to worry, you can always change the size of your image or even the size of the canvas through the image menu. The first thing I want to show you is image size. Here you can adjust the width and height of your document, even the resolution if you like. The sizes are linked by default, so if you needed to modify it, you'll need to deselect constrained proportions. So let's say I wanted it to be 7 by 5, and then you will have to click OK. Now I've resized my document. Now the other way to do it is if you wanted to adjust the canvas size, but not anything that you had on top of it. And actually, let me switch back over to this image. We'll choose canvas size. Now right now I can see that this is roughly 10 by 6, but let's say I needed to make it 12 by 7. What I can do is I can expand the canvas behind my image just by increasing the values in these two fields. Now this area has to do with where the canvas will expand behind my existing image. If you have the dot in the center, then the expansion will happen evenly behind your image, but you can also set the anchor to any of these four corners or any of these midpoints. But we're going to leave it right here in the center, and we say extension color should be the background color, which is white here for my background in my toolbar. So now you can see that it's evenly expanded the canvas behind my image. While you're working, it's often a good idea to show your rulers so that you can create precise measurements when you're moving objects around on your artboard. You can turn your rulers on through the view menu here. There's also a keyboard shortcut to toggle those on and off, and the rulers will display in the default unit of measure that you selected when you created your new file. If you need to modify the unit of measure, you can easily do that by right-clicking on the ruler itself and then choosing a different unit of measure. So let's say that we needed to create an image that was going to go on a website. We'd need to work in pixels and we just toggle it over to pixels. But if we're doing something for print, we're probably going to be working in inches and therefore we could leave it on inches. But you can toggle the ruler on and off at any time and you can even hide it and show it while you're working by using the keyboard shortcut. Although typically once you turn it on, you keep it on, it doesn't take up that much space in your workspace. Another thing that you might want to do is turn on your grids. The grids are also located in the view menu. Under the show menu, there's your grids. Now the grids can be set up in your preferences if you need to alter them, but it's usually four parts per inch. You could set it to eight parts per inch, but it's usually like a, some kind of multiple of two that will divide evenly for an inch. And this will help you with placing things within those different markers. And those also can be toggled on and off with a keyboard shortcut. There is something called Smart Guides. Let me turn that off and then show you Smart Guides. Smart Guides are really great to be working with. They will give you measurements and assist you in placing objects on your artboards. Some people love them. Some people can't stand them. I'll leave it to you to turn them on or off. But those can also be toggled here on and off while you're working. Other things in the submenu include your grids, your guides, your smart guides, slices if you were going to slice some web graphics. You can turn all of these extras on or off at any time. Another thing to turn on is the snap feature. This is really great when you're working with guides, and let's talk about guides right now. Guides are these invisible markers that you can place as many of them as you want onto your workspace that will allow you to organize things, and then you can have your objects snap to your guides. So I'm going to bring a guide onto my workspace by clicking inside my ruler and then dragging out. And then I can align it by looking at the top of the ruler. There's that little double line there, or dotted line rather, that will allow me to position my guide. When I have my guide exactly where I want it to be, I just release my mouse and there it is. By default, it's this aqua blue line. And what's nice about guides is that you can click and drag to readjust them. You can bring as many onto your workspace as I mentioned, and you can pull them out from the left ruler as well as from the top ruler at any time. So I'm just going to drag these on here. Now this one didn't get right on there. In order for me to be precise, I might want to grab my zoom tool 
to zoom in. Then I can hold down my spacebar to convert my zoom tool, or really any tool, into the hand. And the hand allows me to reposition my view of the zoomed in workspace. I can then go back to my black arrow, my move tool, and reposition the guide so that it's snug right up against the edge of this image. Now, if I can't get it right on there, I also might want to zoom in a little bit more to the pixel level for perfect accuracy. With the hand tool, you can do what's called panning. So I'm just sort of flicking, just clicking and flicking the image. You could also scroll using the scroll bar to get to the other edge. And I just want to make sure that my other guide is accurate and it's not. So I'll just click and drag it over. And let's go up to the top. And we'll get that one in position too. So you can zoom in and out. Let me show you the zoom tool a little bit more. So if you click once and click again, single clicks will zoom you into a space. You can hold down your Alt or Option key and that changes the plus sign to a minus sign on the icon itself. And then you can click to zoom out. As you're zooming in and out, you can either click or click and drag. And you'll notice that the zoom percentage is displaying here. I'm just going to reposition our view here. So Alt or Option key allows you to zoom in or out. You could also, let's say I really needed to get close to this spot right here. Just clicking and dragging brings you right into that spot. And then holding down the Alt or Option key reverses you. You can also double click, triple click to zoom in. Another keyboard shortcut is the Command or Control Zero key, which brings you back to fill the workspace with your image. You can also do Command or Control Plus to zoom in. Command or Control minus to zoom out. Keyboard shortcuts really handy to make a note of, and I think you'll use them quite often. Now there is a panel that I really like using. Some people don't use it. I think it's fantastic. It's the info panel. And what I like about the info panel is it shows me where my cursor is on screen. It also gives me RGB values of wherever my cursor is, as well as CMYK values. If I'm making a selection, it will give me the width and height of the selection just gives me other information depending on which tool I have selected. I like to see things, especially when I'm making selections, exactly what the measurement is so I can be completely accurate. There is another panel called the Navigator panel that also allows you to zoom in and out of your work. You can use the slider to zoom in and out. And as you zoom in, you see this little red area. That red area can also be positioned by clicking and dragging. You can click on these little mountain ranges to increase or decrease your zoom. You can even plug in a numerical value if you happen to know what that needed to be. And I just think this is a nice way to move around an image. You get the full preview little window thumbnail, and then you could zoom into a specific area. These panels can be toggled open and closed at any time and will generally assist you in working around the art space. So I'm going to use that keyboard shortcut again, Command or Control Zero to zoom me back in to fill the workspace. The other thing you can do while you're in the Zoom tool is look at the options bar at the top of the screen. You can actually choose Actual Pixels, choose Fit to Screen, which is almost like doing Command or Control Zero. You can say Fill Screen or Print Size. And these are just different views depending on your resolution and your image size that will allow you to zoom in and out of your document. There's also Scrubby Zoom, which if you turn it off, then you have to actually do a marquee to zoom in and out. I love the scrubby zoom, and I think you might too, so I would probably leave that on. And then there's zoom all windows if you had multiple documents open at the same time, and resize windows to fit a particular space. The last thing I want to talk about here is saving your files, and this is important. When you're ready to save, you go to your file menu, and there's two save options. Save for when you're working on an existing file that's already been saved, and you want to save the updates that you're making. Save as to save an existing file as a separate document. So any changes that you made to the current file while you're working, you would save it as a new document and the original file would remain untouched. So if I were to save this file right now, it would save all the changes. It would save the guides and the canvas extension. And I don't necessarily want to do that. But if I wanted to go to my untitled document and save it, it will bring up this dialog box and ask me where I want to save my file. So maybe I want to save it 
in that same folder I was working in, give it a name, and then you have to choose your file format. The default file format for Photoshop is a PSD file, Photoshop document, and this will retain all of your layers and all of your settings, and it's a good idea to work and save your files as PSDs. And the great thing about PSDs, if you're working with other Adobe programs, most other Adobe programs can open and view PSD files. Large document format, you probably never get asked for that, but it's a PSB file. There's also Photoshop EPS. Sometimes a printer may ask you to save a Photoshop file as an EPS for importing into like a page layout program, like an old version of Quark. There's DCS files, which you probably will never use. There's JPEG files, which are low resolution copies of your original that you could also have high res JPEGs actually, but I would not recommend that you save your layered files a JPEG because it will probably flatten all of your layers. The nice thing about keeping your layered file as a PSD is that you can go back in and make modifications to it at any time. JPEG 2000 and JPEG Stereo you probably won't use, although JPEG Stereo is sort of gaining traction lately. It's an interesting concept. Stereoscope images, stereoscopic images where you have two images that combine because of the angle of your eyes into a almost like a 3D image. Multi-picture format you'll probably never use. Photoshop PDF if you wanted to save your Photoshop file as an Adobe PDF you could do that. Raw files as you saw earlier you can work in camera raw so you could save it with a raw extension. Cytex you probably never work with. And then TIFF files can be layered files like Photoshop files and some people may want you to save a file as a TIFF or provide you with a graphic file as a TIFF and that's fine too although I'd probably save it as a Photoshop file just to keep everything consistent. Once you've made your selection there could be some specific save options based on your selection down here. If you wanted to save the image as a copy for instance here you could click save as copy and when you're done just click the save button and then you've saved your file it will show you the name of the file and the file extension at the top along with the percentage of the view and the color space and the number of bits for that image. Now if you wanted to do something like save as just do file save as and it's pretty much the same thing you would give it a name so I might want to call this save as California 2 or something and in this case it was a JPEG file maybe I want to convert this into a layered Photoshop file so that I can work with it and modify it at a later date. Again, it shows you the file name, updated file name, and the file extension. When you're done working with all of your files, all you need to do is click this X to close them. And then anytime you have a document open, this little bar up at the top will show you the tab of all of your open files, and you can toggle between them at any time. And then when you're done working, just click the X button to close it, and you're done.